rack of thunder. This was nothing new in the wastes. Dust storms were a familiar sight on Prometheum. But what came with it was unfathomable. A drop of water, then another, and then another. Something the survivors had never seen. Rain. Welcome back to The Good Mood with The Good Dude, and in this episode, I'm going to take you with me on my journey to the Promethean Wastes. And as always, there are plenty of timestamps in the description box below, so if you want to skip the bullshit and get to the good bits, feel free to click those links. So you're probably wondering, what the hell are the Promethean Wastes? The Promethean Wastes Chop Shop is an e-magazine revolving around the setting of the Promethean Wastes. The purpose of the magazine is to showcase a range of scratch builds and conversions from the hobby community, and each build responds to the challenges set by the magazine's creator, Painty Ways. Together, these contributions help create the world of the Prometheum Wastes. In this world, the planet of Prometheum has recently become home to a diverse group of refugees who were previously fleeing through space. Living across a flotilla of spacecraft for a thousand years has made even the wastelands of Prometheum look appealing to the survivors. Though barren, there are the unmistakable signs that the planet was once inhabited by an advanced civilization. They've long since vanished, but left behind a patchwork of still functional infrastructure that the survivors, now known as wastelanders, can use to rebuild their own societies. Rather than focusing on war between factions, the magazine's building challenges involve survival in the face of the planet's unforgiving environment. Or, if the challenge is to build a sandworm or a waste beast, then it's about contributing to the hostile world of Prometheum. The Prometheum Wastes Chop Shop is a very cool magazine. The link is in the description box, man. Just like go and look at that thing right now. Open up a new tab, go to the URL, download the PDF, read the PDF, follow all the contributors on Instagram, and then come back here and watch the rest of this video. So far, only issue one is available for download, but issue two should be coming out soon. The challenge I'll be working on today should feature in issue two. As the vignette I read at the beginning of the video suggested, Issue 2 moves the story of Prometheum forward by introducing these rains which bring along with them wetlands and swamps and a whole host of life that didn't exist in the wastes before. And so the two challenges that were associated with this issue were challenge number one, build a walker. Challenge number two, build a beast. In this case, I chose to build a walker, but a bit of a beast will make its way into the build as you'll see. My walker is intended to be a fishing vessel that operates within the newly formed wetlands, wading through the swamps and collecting big aquatic critters before taking them back to headquarters and cooking them up. I want this walker to have an insectoid shape, to have a net for its catch and a crew of skinks, since skinks are kind of my thing. As far as I can tell from issue one of the magazine, trash bashing is a big part of the philosophy of the Prometheum Wastes. Now this makes sense as the people of Prometheum would not have a huge range of materials to choose from in the wastes. For my materials, I went to a local charity store to look for things I could use. I found a bag of connects for about $2 and a set of knitting needles of different sizes for the same price. I'm also using a ping pong ball since I had one left over from the Corona Man build and I'm using the knitting that formed a bag of limes from the supermarket. I'm also gonna be using painting pipettes and of course, the main body of the walker is made from an old deodorant bottle. In the first issue of the magazine, one of the challenges was to build a Dio speeder. That's a land speeder made from a deodorant bottle. I thought it would make sense then for my walker to have been built from scrapped parts found in the waste, including a crashed Dio speeder. In addition to these upcycled and recycled components, I'm using the old faithful plastic card sheets, rods and tubes of various sizes, as well as epoxy putties like green stuff and epoxy sculpt, and a couple of extra greeblies from the bits box. 
After cleaning out the deodorant bottle, I started by removing the top and creating space for a cockpit. I used several ping pong balls to create something that looked like a shutter, which could close to protect the pilot if some big nasty creature attacked the walker. I used pieces of plastic card sheet to create the flat surfaces behind the cockpit and after trying to conceal the gaps with epoxy sculpt, I added two rings of plastic card tube for the shutter mechanism. I glued a piece of connects to the bottom of the ping pong ball to make the floor of the cockpit. The pattern of the connects actually worked really well here, adding a bit of sci-fi texture. Once that was in place, it was time to add more texture and detail to the cockpit. First, I added a ladder made of plastic card rod, providing access to the top of the strider from the platform behind the cockpit. I want this walker to look cool, but most importantly, I want it to look functional. That's a key part of making it sell. I looked through my bits box and found a couple of pieces from an old Battlefleet Gothic sprue. These cannons could work as some kind of control panel behind the pilot, and these look perfect as antennae. Maybe this tower backpack is a comms interface, or maybe it contains a fire blanket in case some of the scrapped electronics catches a light. A heap of fat tubes made with Green Stuff World's Roll Maker adds to the cobbled together anarchic flavor of the cockpit. Finally, I created further texture in the cockpit with a bunch of little plastic card pieces. My walker needs a fuel source, so on the back of the deodorant bottle, I used the fat ends of a pair of painting pipettes as fuel tanks. I had a pewter sheet from Green Stuff World, which I had originally bought to use with their leaf punches. I cut strips from these sheets to create the look of metal holding the tanks in place. I then used a short length of plastic rod for the inlet. I used more roll maker fatties to connect the fuel tanks up to the body of the walker. In hindsight, I should have also made some kind of exhaust for the walker, but it totally slipped my mind at the time. While I already had a ladder leading up from the cockpit to the back of the walker, I needed a way for my crew to reach up to the cockpit. So I built another ladder of plastic card rods and glued this to the side of the walker by the cockpit. And if someone's going to be up on the top of the walker when it's wading through the swamp, you're going to want a guardrail. We might be in the wasteland, but there's still occupational health and safety to worry about. For some final detail on the body of the walker, I made a hatch out of all manner of pieces of plastic card. It's actually a little on the small side compared to the skink miniatures, so it'll be a squeeze for anyone trying to get down into the engines. Maybe that just means it's a job for some smaller subspecies of intelligent reptile. To make the legs, I used lengths of knitting needle attached to connects. And to make the connects look less like connects, I covered them in plastic card sheet, adding some extra pieces to give the illusion of metal panels and details. I attached the needles to the connects by filling one of the existing gaps in the connects with putty and inserting the needle. I then drilled a hole in the end of the needle to pin it to the length of plastic card tube that would serve as the knee joint. I then glued this upper leg piece to a wheel from the bag of connects. I should have pinned the two pieces together rather than relying on the glue as the pieces easily came apart and I ended up having to reinforce them with putty. I learnt my lesson and pinned the upper arm pieces to the center piece when the time came. For the column connecting the body to the legs, I had a central rod taken from the bag of connects, which I then surrounded with more roll maker tubes. I ended up making a bunch of these and wanted it to look like a total mess of tubes and piping linking the two main components of this machine together. Originally, all the submissions were supposed to be made to the editor by August 28th. That's the Ink 28th a day every month that is celebrated by kit bashers and converters and fans of Grimdark all throughout the hobby world. Uh, so three days out from that deadline and man, I hadn't even started finishing this thing, let alone started painting it yet. So it was gonna be a serious rush. In the face of this deadline, I decided to cut out some of the details I originally had planned. The first was to dispense with the big diorama style base, along with its lily pads and water effects. I revised my plan to sculpt three fish critters. I'd planned for two of them to be on the base anyway, so they were eliminated along with the base. The fish was made with an aluminium or aluminum foil armature and layers of different epoxy putties. 
As you'll see, I based the fish's design on Blinky, the three-eyed goldfish from The Simpsons. His tail is aligned horizontally rather than vertically, however, as I was originally intending to make these guys metamorphic amphibians like frogs, showing them in different stages of their life cycle. So they weren't intended to be direct replicas of Blinky. However, I abandoned that idea when I abandoned the base, so now it just looks like I can't use reference images properly. To make the claw arm, I drilled a hole in the side of my fish, into which I glued a long piece of wire. This wire could then be covered with a length of plastic card tube, which I could fix to the joint of the arm at the other end. I knew that this was going to be quite heavy because of the weight of the sculpted fish, so I wanted to ensure that the claw arm would be well attached to the elbow joint. The claw itself was made of sections of large diameter plastic card tube, cut so they were big rounded pieces of sheet. The joints were made from much smaller pieces of plastic card rod. With the claw in place, I finished sculpting the fish. To make the second arm, I started by making a wire frame. I then cut a piece of netting from a bag of limes and attached that to the frame. I used more plastic card tube with strips removed to fit over the wire frame, hoping that this would help keep the netting in place and make the whole thing look a little less ugly and messy. I used more putty for the corners, and even though I did a pretty rough job with the putty, it looked way better than it did without it. I then used, you guessed it, more plastic card tubes to cover the wire running the length of the arm. Finally, I drilled holes into the elbow joints of the walker's arms and inserted the wire of the arm pieces. I superglued the wire to the joint, plastic cemented the tubes together, and then filled the elbow joint with more putty, which created a very secure bond. Thankfully, Andrew, the editor, decided to push the deadline back from August Ink 28th to September Ink 28th. Uh, but as anyone familiar with Parkinson's law knows, the amount of work you have expands to fit the space of time that you have to do it. So even though I had an extra month, I did other things along the way. And so when it came around to Ink 28th again, it was a rush. In fact, I didn't even get the thing finished until a couple of days after that, possibly even into October. I took a speed building approach to the Cyborg Skink pilot back before the original August deadline. Rather than spending ages posing his old Necron arms, I got them into a basic position so it would look like he was holding onto the edge of the cockpit, peering down upon his prey. I also did a rush job on the Mechadendrite tentacles that I stuck onto his back. In fact, since I was so sure I could do a better job on these if I'd taken more time, I decided to make a whole video about scratch building mechadendrites, which you can watch if you want to know the general approach I took and see some much better attempts. That also contributed to the rush I had meeting the September deadline. The pilot wouldn't be alone on the walker. Keeping him company is a hunter skink, equipped with a copy of a crude pistol that I had made ages ago using blue stuff. His shotgun was also kit bashed from a Kroot's rifle, with plastic card rods replacing the barrel and some green stuff for the gun stock. His hat was made from Procreate for the brim, plastic card teeth, and green stuff for all the rest, including his vest. Now it was time to finish the walker. I made the lower legs from yet more plastic card rods. I had originally intended on using the knitting needles here, but obviously forgot my original plan. I used pieces of connects for the feet, and because I was really worried that the walker was too front heavy, I attached big metal washers to the feet to stop the walker from falling over. To be honest, painting something this size was a bit of a pain. I usually use cork painting handles, but there would be no painting handle big enough for this beast. I also made generous use of the philosophy that if you can't reach it, then you probably can't see it and you probably don't need to paint it. I had no idea what to do for the paint scheme at the beginning and just experimented by throwing some colours on the different elements. Eventually, I found myself attracted to a steampunk style palette of warm brassy metallics. I carried this palette over to my cyborg skink painting his metal elements like his arms, his cyborg eye, and his mechadendrites in the same warm metallic tones. For the hunter skink, I imagined his hat and vest were made of leather, so Speed painted them a warm reddish brown. 
The fish was painted orange with a little bit of gold mixed into some of the layers to create a light shimmering effect. After laying on several thick coats of Agrax Earthshade, the Swamp Strider was ready to go into the light box for its final photo shoot. I had an absolute ton of fun building the Swamp Strider and would not have made anything like this if it were not for the Promethean Wastes and the associated challenges. If you check out my post on Instagram, you can find a little chunk of writing that accompanies the walker and fits it into the lore of Promethean. I've already seen a bunch of the other contributions to this challenge and they are all amazing. So I can't wait to see them all together in volume two of the Chop Shop magazine. Okay, that brings us to the end of this video. If you're still here, thank you so much for watching. If you liked the video, like the video. Feel free to subscribe if you want to. You can check out my Instagram in the description box below along with all the other links. And you know, if you want to contribute to this stuff, you should check out the Promethean Wastes hashtag, check out Painty Ways, and anyone can contribute. So do not hold back, do not hesitate. It's a lot of fun. Thank you so much for watching. I'm the good dude, this is the good mood, and I'll see you in the future. Maybe I'll even bump into you on the wastes.